Father in heaven, thank you for this community. Um, thank you for uh, the beautiful weather and for fall that you're bringing to Arizona, um, which is basically the high 80s. Uh, but we thank you for that. Um, Jesus, we thank you for this space that you have given us and, and the way that you've led us here and the way that you care for us. And so I just want to declare this space um, your kingdom. And I want to uh, ask that you would honor our presence here in the sense that you would um, care for the different places that we are uh, from being excited about what you're doing in our life to not even knowing if you're true. I just ask that you would engage with us and that your spirit would give us courage to believe what's true and to push out what's false. And I ask that in your name, Jesus. Amen. Um, So it's good to see all of you guys here. We are in James and we will soon be done with James, uh, and I think we're going to, I'm going to speak a sermon on why you should belong to the village. I wouldn't miss that um, if I were you. I love talking about the village, so I always think it's a fun sermon, but that comes after James. Right now we're in the letter uh, by James, James's half-brother of Jesus. We're almost done. We're in chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 7 through 12 or so. So let me quickly give you the two themes, um, or at least the one theme, actually, of James. And that is that James is concerned about what it looks like to be a servant of God, not what it looks like to become a servant of God. And so what, the way we've been approaching this is that the letter of James is sort of a codex in the sense that it is your employee handbook. Um, it's how you're supposed to act as a follower of Jesus, the way you're supposed to look at things. And then it's also a job aid in that it actually says, here, you face this situation. This is the way you need to think. This is the way you need to act. Um, I'm surprised that most of you came back this week because last week I told you you need to give all your money away and you're still here and I have no money. So um, I don't know how that's worked. No, I, last week we talked um, about the idea that the wealth that you have and not just your money, but your, uh, your ethnicity, the, your education, your strength, your physicality, your mental capacity, all these things are things that you have that are your wealth. And when you enter into the kingdom of God, they're no longer yours. They're, they're God's and they're for his, him to use. And we have to kind of look at the things that we have in that perspective as we engage with one another and as we engage in the world. Now this week... Um, we start out in chapter 5, verse 7, and he's going to kind of continue these ideas and and veer off a little bit. Um, So we'll start in verse 7 of chapter 5. It says this, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crops and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. So he starts out with one command, and then he adds to this command a little bit later. And he says, so first he says, be patient. And then he says, be patient and stand firm. And the word patient uh, is two Greek words put together. It's one far away, and the other word means rage or anger. So patience is having your anger and rage far away. Okay, that frustration, anger, rage, it's far away. That's what patience is. And that's the command, be patient. Now, I always grew up hearing pastors and preachers and disciples saying, don't pray for patience because you'll get it, right? And, and Sue always says, oh, I made a mistake in, when I was young and I prayed for patience and this is how it happened in my life. And this, right? Don't pray for patience. No, really do pray for patience. The command is be patient. Now, Obviously, in the first century, patience might look a little different. But for us, it's interesting because I just want to maybe give you a sound that will help us sort of begin to illustrate this idea of patience. So if you would flip the next slide, whoever's clicking, and I'm going to need a little technology help. First off here, we have a modem. Um, And it's a very old modem. And uh, if somebody would, if you could, like, get the mouse and uh, click on the little sound up there in the corner. Yeah, there you go. See the sound up there? Yeah. Now hit play. Oh, no, you just want to hit play over there. Uh Uh-oh, we're going to have to go backwards. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, no. 
You got Yeah, there we go. Let's start at the beginning. Yeah. You're going to have to drag it. Yeah, technical difficulties. Yeah, just flip the slide backwards. Okay, there you go. I don't know. And I hit the play button. There you go. Here we go. There we go. You can turn her up a little bit there. Yes, how many had to ever connect to the internet that way? All right. Um, it, it took a long time to get to the web page that didn't have any information on it, right? Um, because the internet was really slow and there wasn't a lot to do except to chat with people maybe, and even that took a while. Um, this is kind of the modem that I actually started out on, the Commodore 64's modem, I think, or maybe that was for the pet, I don't remember. Anyway, um, patience, like, how many of you downloaded something today? Or this, okay, and did it take you more than 30 seconds to download? Right? Things don't, like, if it gets to 20 or 30 seconds and if it's too long, we're done. And when you get to the dinner table nowadays, like, gone is the opportunity for you to actually spout any kind of wisdom. Because everybody can fact check you. And not only can they fact check you, Right now, somebody, while I'm speaking, find who was the starting shortstop for the Red Sox in 1990, okay? And see how long it takes us to do that. While I'm talking, one of you can be distracted. Um, This idea of patience and this command, it's not something that comes easily to us, right? And so the example then that um, James gives is this idea of the farmer. Now, farmers, they have to be patient. They dig some dirt, they put some seeds in, they take care of it, they wait for the rain, and they wait, and they wait. And there's nothing they can actually do. They can't make the plant grow. Oh, they can help it a little bit, but they can't make it grow. They have to wait. There's this process of waiting that they have to go through. Now, James says, be patient because the Lord's coming is near. The Lord's coming is near. Now, becoming a follower of Jesus is a lot like getting engaged. When I met Susan and finally got her convinced to marry me, I was pretty sure I'd met the person who I wanted to live the rest of my life with. And so I saved up a bunch of money. Yes, you got it. Who was the... There you go. Jody Reed. Played with Wade Box. And, and Clement, see, there you go. 1990 shortstop. See how quickly we got that? We would have never known that till like next week. Right? You would all just waited. So anyway, here I am with, you know, wanting to marry Sue. I saved up all my tip money for my catering to get, I, you know, I paid like $1,300 for the ring in like 1996. I was, it took me a long time. She's the woman I wanted to marry. I went up the mountain with her up to Mount Lemon, and I hid the ring in my sock, and it got stuck, and I was nervous. And we, we got engaged, and she said yes. Apparently, she found the person she wanted to spend the rest of her life with, and then we had to wait. We had to wait for like eight months or something like that. And we had to go through this counseling thing, and we had to plan this wedding that seemed to get more expensive every day and more work for us because we thought, oh, let's cater for 200 people and do it by ourselves because we're smart, right? So there's this period of waiting, and, and I can remember every single time I would drive home from her house, I would think, this is stupid. Let's just elope. Like, I, why should I have to wait? Why should I have to wait? And yet, so when, when you and I choose to follow Jesus and we enter into the kingdom, you taste something. All of us who have stepped into the kingdom of God and followed Jesus, you tasted the living water. At some way, you had a taste of this re- 
refreshing water. And it was wonderful. Right? And yet what you realize as you tasted that water is that you're still living in a world and in a body and with a soul that's broken. And you're waiting. And not only you've tasted this water, but the thing that you're waiting for is described to us by John in Revelation 21. And I love this picture because this is the thing that we're all waiting for. This is the thing we're being patient for. As John explains a vision of the end. And it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And so, when we're told to be patient, the thing that James puts on the end of here is God's going to be near this hope that things are going to be different. The taste of it that you've had of God, and yet here we are called by Jesus to live in the present, and there's this dissonance. And James in all of this is alluding back to the beginning of his letter. And he, in the beginning of his letter, he kind of describes this waiting period, what's happening in this waiting period, and how we're supposed to operate as servants of God as we've tasted of Jesus. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. The process that you and I are in, the reason that James says, okay, live in the present, be patient, hold off the frustration and anger, is that he says there's this process of testing. And I talked about this testing last time and said, remember how bodybuilders work. They work an arm, they tear the muscle, They let it rest, the muscle thickens, right? You get stronger. The result is perseverance. The thing that you can imagine perseverance is, is standing in the way of a wave, a wave crashing on you and you're standing firm, right? This is what's being developed. He's saying, be patient. The thing that's being developed in you is perseverance, which results in maturity, in completeness, and a lack of of nothing, right? You are becoming, right now, in the process, you're becoming more and more like Jesus. But the process that's happening, the reason that God's telling us to be, or James is telling us to be patient, is that there has to be this changing in our heart when we enter into the kingdom. And this is what we're invited into. And that is that when you and I The thing that where where maturity comes from, the thing that maturity is, is where you and I end up finding our sense of being loved, our sense of impact, our sense of significance, our sense of security, right? The thing that God is testing, the reason James is being patient, it's like a farmer, something beautiful is being, is is gonna come out of this, is that you and I, when we step into relationship with Jesus, are given this opportunity to not find our significance and not find our security, not find the way we feel loved and the sense of having impact from one another, from the different things that we pursue, but actually finding it in Jesus. That's what's being developed in you, is having your eyes turned on Jesus. I've used this illustration before, but when you want a little kid to to listen to you and you're talking to them, you need to get down on your hands and knees and put your hands on their face and have them focus. The process in which God is inviting us into, James is talking about here, the reason he's saying be patient is God has got your face 
and he's getting you to look at him. And it's this process of maturing you so that you're not finding your sense of being loved, your sense of completeness, and anything else but him. As you hope for this coming and having everything made new. Now, James talks about the end, and I want to talk about the end of the world just for one little moment, because I know all of you are wondering when the world is going to end. And so he uses this idea of judgment a little later. He talks about the reason that we need to be patient is that God is coming back to make things new. So let's just quickly talk about the end. There are three things that are the way that the end of the world is talked about. Number one, the end of the world is talked about and referred to as Jesus coming back as a victorious army, with his victorious army, to visit the people who he rules. So, it's, so he, here we are, we're this little village here, and we are all the followers of the king, but it's been a long time since we've seen the king. And so the king is coming to visit us, and so there's this idea that the, the announcers... The apostles, the, you and I, have gone out in front of the king and said, he's coming, he's coming. And so all of us as the village go out and meet the king as the king comes in. And a lot of times you would hear this talked about as the rapture. But it's a, a visiting king, or a king coming to visit his province. Okay? The second way that the Bible talks about the end of the world is Jesus appearing to all, everyone as the final authority on his throne. So he appears to everybody. He's the ruler. He appears as king. Okay? So we've got, he's visiting. He's checking out his people. He's coming to his people. He arrives as a king. And then the other way that the end of the world is talked about in the New Testament is the apocalypse, or the laying bare. And it is Jesus coming in all his glory. Okay? So these are the three ways, and they're interchangeable, and they're talked about in the New Testament a lot. I want you to listen to what, how Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 and following, he says, No one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the day of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Do you see this this theme that happens here? It's not that Jesus is saying, figure it out. In fact, he says the sun and the angels don't even know. He's saying there is a constant state of being at watch. The reason that James says be patient is what he's saying is keep your anger and your frustration at bay because it's going to distract you from being ready for the king to come, for all of this to end, and you end You don't want to be taken away. And he gives this little clue. He says, and I love how James does this, he's given you this sort of philosophical thing. You need to be patient. God's developing things in you. And then he says, in verse 9, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Don't grumble. Don't complain. Okay? Who is the most trying thing on your patience? Other people. Most of the time. 
Other people. In fact, who are the people who tell you that you're not loved? Other people are the people who tell you you're not loved. Right? How do you know if you're having a lasting impact in this world? Unless other people tell you you're having a lasting impact. How do you know that you are significant at any level unless other people tell you you're significant? Right? Most of us spend our life gauging, oh, that person smiled at me. Oh, I must be okay with them. Oh, they're talking really weird to that person over there and maybe they're they're looking at me. Oh, no. Oh, wow, like everybody's happy when I talk and they smile and laugh at me. I must be a good speaker, right? Like, you guys are really hard on me, right? Because you're constantly giving me mixed messages. Sometimes I think, wow, they really think I'm cool. And sometimes they th- I think, oh my gosh, I-, I need to get out of here because they're all going to tar and feather me and get rid of me, right? And, and we have all-, all of us have this experience of life. Like, where we're constantly gauging our value. And what, the reason, what James is saying is, look, 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 your value doesn't come from other people. Your value comes from God, right? And so that doesn't allow you to judge other people. Now, don't grumble lest you be judged. Well, grumbling is just judging other people, right? Just judging other people. But this word judge actually is to be carried off, right? To be taken away. To be spirited away. So James is holding on to this theme that his half-brother has of Noah. Nobody knew what happened and everybody was spirited away by the flood and Noah stayed. There's this woman in the field. They're grinding stuff. One woman is taken away. What James is saying is if you're not watchful, if you're not engaged, if you're not part of this mission of servanthood, you're going to be somebody who's grumbling and you're going to be carried away. You're going to be judged. You're going to be, you're going to be pushed out. Right? You're going to be pushed out. So, goes, the next thing that James does is says, okay, I get that this is difficult. I get that it's hard not to grumble. I get that it's hard to keep your anger at bay and not be impatient with what God is doing. So, let me get practical. He says, brothers... As an example of patience in the face of suffering. Now let's pause here and talk about suffering. Suffering is a very subjective thing. You cannot compare somebody who lost their husband and somebody who lost their legs. You cannot compare. Like, how do you know what suffering really is? Like, suffering, the symptoms of suffering look different all over the place. You can't say, oh, you have more suffering than I have. We just don't know. But what we do know is that there is a universal suffering that all of us face if we decide to follow Jesus. And that is, we find out that we don't belong here. We don't belong here. Like, you are no longer a citizen of the United States. Your identity no longer comes from being a citizen of another part of the country, or of Canada, or of someplace in Europe or Africa, like you don't, that isn't your identity. Your identity is no longer your ethnicity. Your identity is not your education. Your identity isn't what, you know, what the world kind of says about you and your physicality. Your identity is not any of that anymore. Your identity is in a kingdom that has not yet come, and yet you're called to live in the midst of a kingdom that is broken and proclaim that it's coming. And you know what that is? It's really disappointing. And it's full of despair. Because here you've tasted something deep and you know what Jesus is like and the Spirit of God is in you and at the same time you don't belong here anymore and there's this tension and there's this brokenness that we all have to wrestle with. And you know I'm right. You know this is the way it is. You know it's the thing you experience. I'm not not saying there aren't happy times. Tasting Jesus is good. But there's this this sacred discontent. This is the disappointment deep down in us that we just can't get filled up. 
and it's only going to be met when Jesus comes. And James says, here's, an, here's some examples. He says, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who persevered. Okay. So what he's blessed means, we consider those to be connected to God, the ones who made it through, who persevered. Perseverance is patience and standing firm. They stood in what they believed. And so you think, okay, he's going to tell us about Jeremiah. He's going to tell us about Isaiah. Maybe he's going to tell us about some minor prophet like Obadiah. No, he says, you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord's finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So he picks Job. How many of you have read Job? Or even Does everybody know? Okay, you've read Job. Um, Job, interestingly enough, is probably one of the oldest books in the Old Testament and in the Bible. And it seems like Jesus, it seems like James assumed that Job was a real person. But the way that Job is written, most scholars think that it's a, it's a morality play. It may be a, a real person, but it's something that's told over and over in the Hebrew liturgy because it's the way that the Hebrew, the way that you and I are actually called to follow God and to experience God and interact with God when we're in suffering. And I don't know if you've read Job, but he complains all the time. He complains and he complains. So I, I only picked a few of his complaints, but I want to read them to you. So Job 10, 1 through 2 says, I loathe my life. I will give full vent to my complaint. I will speak in bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Let me know why you contend with me. Job 7, 11 and following says, Therefore I will restrain my mouth. I will speak in anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or the sea monster that you set a guard over me? If I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint. And then he goes into this long old complaint about things. Job 9, 27 and 28 says, Though I say I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my sad countenance and be cheerful. I am afraid of all my pains. I know that you will not acquit me. In the midst of Job, who loses parts of his family, who's covered in boils, who has a bunch of friends who give bad advice, it just seems like it gets worse and worse in his life, he passionately complains. He passionately complains. And yet in the midst of that compassionate complaint, the thing that he never actually questions is God's compassion and his mercy. That the thing that Job anchors himself to in the midst of all the trials is that God is compassionate and God is merciful and therefore I can go to him and tell him that this sucks. This is bad. I don't like what you're doing and I don't understand it and you're crazy. Right? And say all these things. Because then in like Job 16, 9, he says, even now my witness is in heaven, my advocate is on high. Job 19, 25, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. He believes that God is compassionate and has mercy. And because of that, he has the ability to complain. He has but here's the thing. The invitation that comes from James is not for you and I to grumble to one another about how bad it all is. The invitation from James in developing our patience and being able to stand firm is that you and I have to face the living God saying, I know you're compassionate, I know you're merciful, and now I'm going to tell you where I'm at and the, the disappointment of my soul. And I am going to wait for you to answer me. The invitation is not only, though, to be with James, it's to be with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane for us to say, just like Jesus said, if there's any way for this cup to be passed, pass it. I don't want it. And yet to understand that as our suffering joins with Jesus' suffering, something good comes out of it. Right? Jesus stepped into the cross, conquered death, rose from the dead, gave us an opportunity to even have this conversation. 
So interestingly enough, after this great encouragement, James then says something really interesting. He, he quotes his half-brother. He says, Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, or you will be condemned. So in the midst of all of this, he goes back to the thing that seems to be a theme in James, which is be hot or be cold. Give a direct answer. Now, in the first century, they were used to swearing by everything, okay, so that they didn't have to do anything. So if you swear by God, you're inviting God into your swear, so I, your oath. So you say, hey, I promise to do this by God. You have to do that. You invited God in. So they invented lots of different ways. I swear by the heavens. I swear by the earth. So you don't have to do what you're saying you're going to do. Right? So there's this whole kind of culture that James is speaking into where everybody's kind of wishy-washy and nobody actually does anything that they say they're going to do. And James' invitation is, if you're going to do this, if you're going to step in and you're going to be patient and you're going to live in this place where the world is broken, where you've tasted God, where you're going to actually engage in deep relationship, then you better just do it. You better say yes or no. When you engage with one another, you can't manipulate. You're going to have to say yes or no. You're going to have to stick to your word. So tonight... Here, here's my thing that I want to just kind of dialogue with, with all of you. Is first off, just I would appreciate if you'd push back on me because I want to have a conversation about this, and I think I have enough time. I spoke fast enough. What time is it? All right. Well, we're going to pretend like I have a lot of time because they have four adults back there. Um, I want you to push back on me a little bit, but I, I want you to, to think about, like, okay, what, what is it that God is actually inviting me into tonight when it comes to patience, when it comes to deciding if I have, who is actually going to be the author of my impact and how I feel loved? Like, I want to have that dialogue, and I want to talk about how do you feel about complaining to God? Like, can you actually complain? Are you, can you give Job-esque agony to God? Or do you just kind of pour it on yourself and pour it on everybody else? Like, talk to me about it. Yes. Oh, yes. Somebody, Mike. Oh, here we go. Just pass the mic around. In theory, I like the idea a lot, but it's not something I've practiced. Um, I have a Catholic background, so the first word that comes to mind when I think of doing that is just irreverent. Like it would be irreverent to talk to God in that way. Even though I know it's not true, but I'd still feel that way if I tried doing that. You know. No, that's good. It, there's a sense of irreverent. To add on to oh, that, I feel that way. Sorry. Go ahead. But, no, um, good. I have recently been walking forward in that and just telling God in my heart, even when it's like, God, I really hate this. Like, can you take it away from me? And, but also he invites me to sit in it sometimes. I've noticed recently. <laughs> cool. Anybody else? We, we're going to need a mic runner. I, I find that it's, I usually think, well, of course I feel bad. I did this to myself. And <clears throat> I guess the thing I was realizing as you were talking is that what that does for me is it gives me control over who impacts my life. I impact my life. <laughs> you know, Eric, as, uh, as you were talking and sharing this sermon, um, my thoughts came back to two years ago when I stood at the pulpit and I gave a sermon and I had a panic attack right in the middle of it. And God just really put that in my brain as you were talking. And I thought about having the panic attack and how I reacted to it, how it was a real place of shame for me. And I've never listened to that sermon because it absolutely killed me that 
one of the few things that I felt like I did well in this world was stripped from me as I was felt completely embarrassed to completely fall apart in front of my home. And then I thought about earlier this summer when the article in the newspaper came out and I thought about my reaction to that and and I confess that I did not react very well to that at all. I I was hurt by being outed for an embarrassing situation and I hurt you and I hurt Rod and I think that I hurt other people in this community in the way that I reacted to that and I wasn't being patient and I wasn't using the place that God has given me to express my discontent and express my pain. I was taking it out on people that I loved and and I just yeah, you know, I have no pushback for you, Eric. This was a very convicting sermon for me. And I and I love you for it and I appreciate that. And and I really believe that God is leading me into a place where yeah, I'm not just lashing out at everyone around me because of this happening or this falling apart. Like I'm slowly but surely learning how to handle those things differently. And really, the village has a lot to do with that process. So thank you. We've got, we got Ruben over here. Who's I don't know if ba- I really need a mic. People tell me I'm loud. It's for the recording. Welcome, welcome back, by the way. I don't like the way my voice sounds like microphone. I would rather just yell. Um, I've done a lot of complaining to God because I had no one else to talk to sometimes and no one else really wanted to listen. And I've done a lot of complaining and I've often thought of Job while complaining and uh, wondered if he was nearly as offensive as I was and some of the things that I had to say because, you know, at some point in, in a place where You'd rather just be honest. You know, it's on your heart if that's how you really feel. God already knows. And what I found, because I've spent a lot of time apologizing for some of the things that I've said, you know, in my complaint to God, too. You know, I'm really sorry. You know, that's really disrespectful, but I don't know what to say. I disagree. And I found that I've talked my way out of emotional corners as many times, just felt about it, you know, and God showed me some really interesting things in my having been really honest with him in my complaint, and it, it actually opened up a whole new area in my prayer life. I didn't know it could be so real and so honest, so, anyway. Cool. I think we had some more over here. No, I wanted to say something, so I took the microphone. Okay. Uh, so... John and Patty went to this conference. If they haven't given you a book yet, they may at some point. But it was about sorrow and lament. And there's a chapter in this book on Job. And I was always really confused about Job growing up because I was Catholic too. But I read it and I was like, his friends sound kind of smart. Like, I'm supposed to think they're stupid, but I was really confused growing up. And this book reframed it to say, like, actually what Job is doing is like, yeah, like all these things in life have been stripped from him. And he's, like, in the throes of loss. And, like, what his friends are doing is actually, like, trying to distract him from conversation with God. Like, he's actually trying to be in relationship with God. And the whole point of it is relationship with God. Like, if you're having an issue, like, with a friend or in your marriage, like, by actually talking to them and, like, not, like, venting, but, like, actually talking about what's really happening in the relationship, that's engaging in relationship. So by avoiding it, you're actually not engaging in a relationship. And I feel like that's reframed for me uh, a little bit about, like, the idea of talking to God about the things I am angry or hurt or struggling with um, in the sense that it's, like, building intimacy with God, which we are deeply afraid of. So I think think that's helped put some of the finger on it in a way. Like, I actually am terrified, we all are, of intimacy with God. That's why we don't want to talk to him. Mm. So that's why it's easier to like call up a friend and be like, blah, 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 because I don't have to face like Jesus. So I think I've been convicted lately about avoiding intimacy with Jesus and like letting myself be distracted. 
All right. One more person. Somebody. All right. All right. So just for the sake of pushback. Um, so my uh, my childhood complaints uh, were addressed by uh, the phrase, well, there are starving children in Africa. And uh, so a lot of my complaints as a youngster were invalidated. And now I work in a hospital where I'm surrounded by people in agony. And uh, something that I uh, would definitely categorize as suffering. So I'm curious how, or what maybe your opinion is on really what qualifies as true suffering and how even if we experience suffering at a really small level that could easily be, well, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't complain about this because it's small. Um, like, it, sure. does God really, what does God hear? So first I, I would say that all of those things on the outside, like the pain of loss, things happening to our bodies, all those kinds of things, those are, I mean, pain. If we're just talking about pain, there can be different levels of pain. But, but ultimately, suffering is about inside the deep, eternal connectedness to disappointment and the longing to get out of this world. To not, not necessarily escape the world, but to realize that there's something better, something deeper, and that whatever it is that God has placed in front of us, because there are trials of many kinds, um, we're called to step into those things, and we can lament about them, because they're not the way they're supposed to be. But when we engage in a relationship with like that, I would argue that we begin to get God's heart, and so our lament and complaint is not about us anymore. Our lament and complaint are about the people in the in your hospital. The lament and complaint are about our friends who are wrestling with their own things. Like our, we begin to get a deeper taste of a world that's broken and our participation in that. Yes, we can rejoice that we've been given lots of different gifts by God, and that's part of it. But I think it connects us. I mean, all suffering is legitimate suffering, even suffering that's brought on you. And in fact, the mark of Christianity that makes it different than everything else is that we have mercy on you even if it's your fault. (laughs) That that's what Jesus calls us to. Even if it's your fault, we have mercy on you. We love you. You're one of us. Because we're stupid too. Um, Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this community and their wisdom and their understanding. Um, and your Holy Spirit on us. I just ask that you would take what's been said tonight and that you would push it deep into our hearts, um, that it would permeate our conversations, and that you would give us more wisdom as we speak truth into one another's lives. And I ask that in your name, Jesus. Amen.